is the entire leadership, senior leadership of Kimberly Clark, and we got a lot of important work for us to do. But before we kind of get into some of the topics, we got some exciting things to share with you this evening, just to get us rolling. Uh, I do recognize, uh, you know, we have this meeting every other year. This is the JJ. This is called the summit. This is the chairman summit. Yes. And we have a forum. There's two things going on, right? And so, but not everybody's been here. So we've got a lot of people who are here for the first time. And so what we've asked that the uh, ELT members to do is to make a short introduction of all of our first time summiteers. Right? So maybe uh, if we get going, I'm going to start number one with uh, the person who has the longest list, Tris. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I even have it yet because there's so many uh, new members of the team joining me. So on, on my right here, first of all, Ina, uh, who, uh, who joins us and is leading our Middle East and Africa business, joins from Mars, where he's previously run the Asia Pacific Middle East and Africa. Welcome. Uh, and then Casey, who's not such a new face, Casey Moran, who many of you will know from her previous roles in the global team, uh, is now in EMEA, leading uh, actually our AFC and currently BCC business as well. Uh, Casey, and is Tal here? Here. Tal, who has joined us, uh, who is Greece, who is leading Coca Cola in Israel, uh, who is now leading our business in Israel. Welcome to the company, Tal, who is now for about six months. Dan and I. Dan, who leads our commercial transformation with regards to all things in market execution, RGM, uh, and, and more besides. Uh, so, we're joining for the first time. But not, not, not a new member of KC. Dorothy. Cheers. Who is our uh, communications leader for EMEA, uh, also joining the company new, uh, who else? And uh, Michelle, Michelle Hanson. Yes. It's over there, Michelle, who is uh, our, uh, our head of uh, Asia for, for Western Europe. Uh, welcome as well. Thank you, Trish. Welcome. <laughs>
We have one new attendee, which is Grad Team this year, Stephanie May. Where are you? She's been here for about six months. Uh, she was at Ernst & Young for a number of years, and then at a uh, CPT company in Dallas. She handled many things for strategy, most importantly the ELP agenda. <laughs> <laughs>
time in HR, which we're finding is a tremendous asset. But Dan is our leader of our communications organization. Oh, Seems like a now type of issue. So why can't we have plastic-free bed webs now? 
But let me tell you that there are already plastic free bed webs today in the market available. So why don't we? At that stage, they brought the consumer into the discussion. So the consumer is a parent. What is the number one most important thing to them? It is to do the best for their baby. Or whenever they're using baby wipes on their baby, they're being seen as public enemy number one. So they go to the store, they buy a plastic-free baby wipe, they use that on their baby. Immediately they see this is not a product that they want to use on their baby. And it costs four pounds, whereas regular uh, baby wipes cost less than one pound. They're faced with a very big dilemma. It was then that my team said, we have a purpose. Our purpose is that parents should not need to choose between what is best for the baby and what is best for the planet the baby grows up in. And then they brought this into the room. So I was wondering what is this, as, as you may. So, apparently, Huggies Bay Works has 50% less plastic than all other uh, leading uh, Bay Works today. Every household that will shift to Huggies will save the equivalent of what is in this trolley, 63 plastic bottles. In fact, each 1% share that Huggies gains in the market is the equivalent of removing 7 million plastic bottles from the UK market every year. 7 million. Wow. So, you asked us what is our plan? Here is our plan. We want to start a real conversation with consumers. This should be a joint responsibility. We will ask consumers to take three tiny steps. One, never flush baby wipes. Two, recycle wherever possible. And three, shift to Huggies. We will take three giant steps. We will bring to market 100% recycled packaging. We will bring to market 100% plastic free baby wipes. And three, we will bring to market 100% curbside recyclable packaging. And this is how the tiniest footprint program was born. So the stack of letters on my desk, that was middle of May. This program was on air August 1st. And I'm happy to show you some of the results. Travis Bay Wives grew 100 basis points market share in 2019, reached almost 15% share. In January 2020, it's more than 16 and a half share, became brand market leader, grew 6% organic sales, went back to making money after years. And in addition, the team set themselves a goal to grow 20% in 2020. Now that is helped by J&J exiting the market. But this is my last takeaway from this story, where our competitors see adversity, we at Kimberly Clark see opportunity to lead the world in essentials for a better life. So I want to circle back to that letter from Ava. I was very touched by the letter. I remember hoping that my kids would grow up to, uh, to care as much as Ava does. And I replied, telling her exactly that. I think it is kids like Ava that should drive us to action and inspire us to be purpose-driven. So I'd like to thank you, and I thank the, the UK and EMEA and teams, and I'll leave you with, with a video as I, as I finish. Thank you. We believe you shouldn't have to compromise between caring for your baby and caring for the environment.
uh, it's got, she has two of the most on-trend categories in CPG. And, uh, and we've got a great brand in Kotex, or you buy Kotex in the US, and Depend and Poise in adult care. And uh, I think Gulen is going to talk about a really exciting opportunity to bring the thinking together and exploit a really big opportunity for us that could go global. And, uh, and so maybe I'll um, invite Gulen to come up and tell us about one moment.
sweet game, it's the girl game, and anything and everything in between. And when one of my best friends asked me, how are you? I started talking about my son, how he's doing. I said, no, no, you're not. How are you? And she was the only one who asked that, and I burst into tears. And we are all guilty of this, right? All the baby companies, if a woman becomes pregnant, you are suddenly a mother. And it's all about the baby, it's all about the family. But in fact, birth is potentially the most profound change a woman goes through, both physically and emotionally. And unfortunately, it's very likely that she will have experienced her first urine leakage during that time too. Now, in basic driven marketing, we are able to give her the right message at the right time so that she has a solution for herself. We are now able to take care of the whole person, herself and her baby. We use the same insights to build our innovation pipeline. There are six demand spaces that align and accelerate growth for this category. Two of them are white, white spaces. Nobody's doing a good job in those. So we built a five-year innovation plan to take care of the needs, emotional and physical needs, of these six demand spaces. And we took them to our customers with our innovation pipeline and innovation summits. We also identified that we were behind on two uh, trends, reusables, so we invested in things, who is the leader of that category, and organic and naturals. We didn't need to go buy anyone because we had the best in the, of the best in the market, in the company, which was Johan Kimberly. So we took their best of the best portfolio and launched Navi, a new brand, in less than nine months. With that, we come to the navigation piece. We need to be able to help our consumers to find the product. So we shared with our customers in the innovation summit what the perfect women's personal care item would look like, the portfolio and the navigation tools, so that she can find her product, the right product, the first time and every time. So it's not moving. <laughs> is our framework for growth, and it's our daily inspiration for our team. We will shape the future with innovation, communication, and navigation, so that she can live life as she chooses. With one woman strategy and our incredibly talented North American team, we were able to last year get an unprecedented level of growth, more than 5% growth. We were also able to accelerate category growth, and for the first time since P&G launched into the category, we grew share in our adult care brands. Customers, the customers recognize us as top leaders now. Do you know how I know that? Because now they are reserving their space, their place in their innovation summit, and they're willing to fly up to Nina in winter. Right? So that is commitment. And best of all, our team has a swagger back. We're leading, we're not following. So if I learned one thing in this journey, when the purpose is worth fighting for, it brings the best in people. The insights that we need to grow is with the consumer. But the ingenuity and the power to accelerate growth is with our incredibly talented team. And in this case, the North America multifunctional team. Thank you. speaker uh, is going to talk about uh, Coco, uh, which was launched in China uh, 18 months or so ago. It's been a home run. And as you may, may, may understand, uh, for coronavirus reasons, Mike Jang couldn't travel out of China right now, so to ruin our, our RSL for BCC has agreed to uh, present and, and, and really tell the story well. But here's the, here's the thing I'm asking of you. So Tarun always runs by his presentations through his eight-year-old son before he presents. <laughs> and, and his his boy does not get this concept of no slides TED talk. And so whatever whatever it is here, you need to give a massive response because we're videotaping so it's not can see. So come on up, Tarun. So every time I have any kind of uh, presentation or speech uh, in 
case, you might always ask me, uh, what is the contribution that Sid made? Sid is my eight year old. So this time when I was, uh, uh, you know, he, he asked me, where are you going, Dad? I said, I'm going to the US, I have a job to give. When I said there no slide, he was, Chris was very strict, only no slide. So I said, okay. So then, then I told him about the TED Talk. So he Googled a lot about the speakers of the TED Talk. He said, I have to give you some input. TED Talk speakers dress in a pretty flashy fashion. <laughs> so if anyone is wondering why I'm the only guy wearing his mustard trousers, <laughs> Disrupt or get disrupted. In today's day and age of doing business, speed may not be the main thing. It may well be the only thing. You know, lines like these are those that we often hear about in you know, panel discussions or we read about in books. The story that I'm going to tell you captures the essence of these lines at its very heart. It is the story of what transpired in the largest diaper market in the world, China, in the last 18 to 24 months. It is a story, yes, of maybe business strategy. It is a story of innovation. It is a story of engineering skills. But to me, it is a story of grit. It is a story of resilience. And more importantly, I think it is a story of courage, as demonstrated by the outstanding women and men who make up Emily Clark in China. I first went to China about, I think, three and a half years ago when I had just taken this job. It's a very vivid memory in my mind because Mike Chang, uh, you know, he took me to the market. It was a small town of Shanghai. He said, you know, let's get a little deeper into China. And we walked into a store called a baby store. A baby store, as you know, no, 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 no prizes for guessing, was, a, was predominantly a retail outlet which predominantly sold stuff for mom and baby. And I remember walking into the store and standing in front of this big diaper aisle. At that time, 70 to 80% of the diaper aisle was made up of what I used to then call jokingly the big four of the category, because I'm a tennis fan, so I used to call it the big four. Kimberly Clark, our friends and competitors from Cincinnati, and the two Japanese bearers, the Kao Corporation, who has a brand called Mary's, and Unicharm, which has brands like Honey Coco and Mooney. So that's about, you know, if this is the shelf, if this is, if this is the shelf, about that much of the shelf. The balance 20 to 30% were a plethora of local brands manufactured in different parts of China. Cool, no issues. If I fast forward this, maybe two to three quarters, this entire ratio had completely turned on its head. From 30 70 in favor of the big four multinationals, 70% now was, was in the category, was the, was the local brands in China. They had done this by capitalizing on this latent need in China that the Chinese mom had of thinner, more flexible, and more breathable diapers by tapping into a technology that they had been tinkering away, tinkering away, but finally it reached that tipping point and exploded in the market called Complex Four. Now, a lot of us have uh, been reading, have read, maybe some in the flight, books, a uh, book by Zook and Allen called Founders Mentality. What did that do as a problem? It was absolutely a free fall. Because at this time, it was also coupled with one of the largest pricing disruptions in the market, where the pricing table fell almost 25 to 30%. What was the impact? Kimberly Clark China, one of our largest businesses, lost almost a quarter of its top line in the matter of months and quarters, and it lost close to 99% of its profitability. Just take a moment, 99% of its profitability. In this context, the team came together and put all their best intent and all their best acumen together and created their own version of what we call the complex core made in China. It was an outstanding product, it was thinner, it was more breathable, it was better fitting, and it gave mom a wonderful experience. At this time, a very calculated bet was made. 
we had not figured out how to make it on our own lines. We had to outsource a critical part of this from a third party. The advantage, we were able to move quickly and get it to market. The disadvantage, it was expensive. Remember the context of the pricing drop. But the team believed at this time that if we did not make this move that we called the offline launch, we would be decimated. But more importantly, we believed that with the might of Kimberly Clark, we would solve the way of making this 100% online on our own machines. We launched offline, our consumer base started stabilizing. In parallel, all the effort to get this online, including with a lot of effort coming in from Nina and other parts to help China, and we were able to finally crack the solution to make it on our MDP and BDP assets for our pants and for our BCM assets for our open tape and open data. This was launched sometime in 2019. As a result of this launch, we have started recovering our consumer base. And where we've been able to launch this, we've started seeing our shares start to climb back. The mo more importantly, this has happened because we've been able to do this online, we have been able to give profitable growth back to the business. And in spite of the pricing table being, even today it's about 20 to 25% lower, we are back to our gross profit levels of before the disruption happened. As we look at this in China, uh, you know, as I look at this sitting as the RSL, for me, China is almost, I would say, akin to a crystal ball. Uh, the reason I say it's akin to a crystal ball is it's almost telling us where the category is going. And we see this coming into China. So the other step that we've taken is that we have now got this platform in strategic parts of the portfolio in every single market in Asia Pacific, barring one, Australia, and I know that's here somewhere, and that's slated to come in, I think, in October of this year. Because we believe that before someone else comes in again and disrupts us, uh, we better have our place of it out that we can lead from the front and disrupt them. So it's there now in over 10 countries for credit. People often ask me when I, when I you know, when you think of this, and I said, this is all in 18 to 24 months, what is the biggest learning? For me, the biggest learning is one word, which is speed. But speed is not easy, right? Speed, I look at speed from two angles. I look at speed from angle number one, which is how scary speed can be. You know, when, when we think about disruption, I can almost say that I tell my eight year old, yes, life will be disrupted, son, when you grow up. Oh, that's like a generation of people. Today, that disruption is happening in weeks, months, and quarters. So that's the scary part of speed. But the, the affirmative part of speed and the joyful part of speed is when speed is leveraged, what a lethal source of competitive advantage it can be. And that's what we saw. The last thing I'll leave you with is uh, the China team has not rested on this. Uh, we have something which we affectionately call Coco version V2. Uh, it's called V2, as the light light knows. V2 is the next generation of the complex core. Uh, it's even thinner, and it's really, really, the big jump that we've got between V1 and V2 is on dryness or v wet as a technical, as a technical term. It's a significantly superior solution, and between now, or I say now, between 1st of January to, I think, the 30th of April, China will now change 320, over 320 SPUs, and re-overhaul the entire portfolio to disrupt themselves now once again. No other multinational in uh, China's market has been able to do this, and it's a real credit to the China team and to everyone here. I'll end again with just those two lines, disrupt or be disrupted. And finally, speed, ladies and gentlemen, is not the main thing. In today's day and age, it may well be the only thing. Thank you very much. Your next speaker really requires no introduction because here he is, Mr. Flash himself. <laughs> 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 Thank you.
You know, you know he, he's uh, Rob's a drummer, folks, so he doesn't like to shake my hand. <laughs> but the thing is, he's got five dogs, and he lets his dogs drink out of his beer glass. <laughs> Horizontally 
and vertically. So basically the air bubbles in there want to push the fibers apart. And what this means is the potential for a lot better formation. There's also the potential for a lot more diversity of fibers we can potentially use. So with our water-based processes today, we're limited to six millimeters in length of fiber. With foam forming, we've discovered we can use fibers seven times that length. So I don't think we can imagine at this point what that could potentially mean in terms of our products that we can make. But it can be very differentiated. Okay? I also mentioned less water. So to make this box of white ball with foam, okay, instead of today's 255 gallon drums, we believe we can make that with four or five gallon buckets. So a pretty dramatic reduction in water, which is great from a sustainability standpoint. Okay? What does this also mean? Okay? Less drying. Okay? Less drying required means less capital. Okay? Less drying required means less energy costs, potentially dramatically. And you think through our, our assets, a lot of them are capacity constrained at the drying end. How much more capacity can we get off some of these machines? 5%, 10%, 15% some of the estimates? We've got more work to do, but it looks very interesting. So the idea itself seems potentially very compelling, okay? The big question is, and this is where sometimes the breakthroughs break down, can you run it on a commercial asset? So can you, can you take it from the pilot line, we're running it in Roswell, we're running it at the x and Nina, but we're running 30 meters per minute. Can you take it to 300 meters per minute on a commercial asset? That was really the test we put forward to ourselves in 2019, okay? That was the challenge. And the goal of this, by the way, the goal of this challenge, it wasn't to make a product specifically. We just wanted to see, can we actually run foam on a commercial asset? Okay? So the team worked together, and I'll tell you, they bypassed the control systems. They were running pipes and pumps and hoses everywhere to see how to make this work. Again, they weren't looking to make a product, but they did. So let's cut back to the PowerPoint. So this is a baseline. This is our current hydrogen product. It's basically this product right here. We ended up making two, two rolls in production. And for those of you that have been around research special runs, you know the first run on a commercial line, you typically don't want to show it off. Okay? Let me show you roll number one. Okay, this came off the first roll. Would you believe within there, we also used 5% less fiber? Okay? And the performance was very similar to current hydrogen. And of course, there's a lot of work to do for us to optimize this process. But this, this proof of concept really got the team excited. And I think it created, some of the non-believers became believers very fast when they saw this. Everybody seemed to be surprised. And I'll tell you, we've got very good collaboration happening between the R&D teams right now. The KCP team, I'll tell you, is absolutely all in on this. And we are marching towards a 2022 full foam forming asset that can run commercial product and hopefully take products like this into a very different spot that we're able to compete historically. So people close to this process, okay, or I should say people that have come and seen this process maybe for the first time that have been close to other processes historically, they tend to say, this looks really cool. It seems like uptad in the early 90s. Okay? I'm going to tell you it's much bigger. Whereas uptad was one technology, okay, mostly focused on towels and tissue, and a lot of the focus was cost-saving candidly, Foam forming is a platform that has the potential to apply across technologies. You think about processes that use a lot of water. Family care, KCP washroom. Foam forming has the potential to create a product that's equal to or better but significantly lower cost. You think about a process or a product where fiber differentiation could make a huge difference in the performance attributes. And I'm thinking personal care in particular. 
phone form, it can be a big unlock for us. The work we've done so far has tested phone forming to say, how would it help us with health? How would it help us with thin core? How would it help us with reducing or eliminating plastic in our products? We're finding very, very good results across all these areas. My ask of you, if you're curious about how this technology could enable differentiation in your categories in your business unit, catch me at some point this week. Catch Peter Heber. Catch Pete Delgamera. We're in a super unique place where KC has a truly breakthrough technology. And this platform can help us provide major differentiation while also putting in major competitive modes. Let's be bold. Let's go on the front foot. Let's really get aggressive and figure out how can we exploit this technology to dominate in the categories for the play. Thank you. Group photo. They want a group photo. 